Hi, everyone. Uh, Charlie Alvesetti here, uh, broadcasting live from Boston, Massachusetts. Welcome to uh, Cannabis MBA M&A uh, with Vicente Cedarberg. This is uh, the second in our, our series of webinars um, on sort of corporate transactions in the cannabis industry. The first one was on private financings. If you didn't have a chance to check that out, if you go to YouTube, uh, we've got a channel there, Vicente Cedarberg uh, LLP. Uh, you can subscribe and, and uh, have access to all our sort of videos here. Um, we'll also be sending around the slides uh, and the video after this presentation. So uh, we're just getting kicked off here. So I'll, I'll kind of start slowly to give everyone a chance to filter in if, if people are coming in a few minutes late. Uh, but in the interim, I want to introduce my co my speakers who are joining me. Uh, so it's me on the left. I'm based in uh, Boston, but I, I actually just moved here from, from Denver, so I'll actually be covering Colorado for the purposes of this presentation. Uh, we also have joining us Cassia Furman, who's based in Los Angeles, uh, one of the top experts on uh, cannabis regulations in California. I'll let her say hi. Hi everyone, happy to be here today with everyone and uh, broadcasting from a minor construction site that is my work from home office, so hopefully no interference there. I'll be staying on mute except when I'm speaking. Thanks Cassia. And also uh, Jeremy Shaw, who's also uh, based here in Massachusetts. I'm Jeremy, uh, I'm, I'm broadcasting from uh, my home just outside Boston, so I'll, I'll be trying to stay on mute so you don't hear my uh, one-year-old in the background, but uh, good to be here. Thanks, thanks, Jeremy. It's not a uh, it's not a Zoom call, or I guess Teams call, unless you hear <laughs> at least a dog barking or <laughs> at some point. You got it. All right, so, you know, I guess, you know, this is sort of us just, you know, bragging about ourselves, but just to introduce kind of the, the conceit here is, we're going to try and talk about cannabis M and M and A, you know, on the whole, which is which is a difficult thing to do because cannabis is such a state by state regulated industry that you can't really talk about cannabis and M and A in a specific manner unless you're talking about a specific state. So, I've tried to set up this presentation to talk about sort of the broad buckets of issues that we see in the cannabis industry, um, and then you know as I go along to to break up the monotony of listening to me, uh, Cassie and Jeremy will, will pipe up from time to time and say, you know, hey, this is this is what happens in Colorado, or sorry, California or Massachusetts. And I may sort of jump in with a specific note about Colorado. And then, you know, we have some slides later in the presentation where we'll specifically break it down, um, you know, state by state, um, you know, and then at the end, we're going to have a question period try and take 10, 15 minutes of questions. Obviously email us afterwards if we don't have a chance to, to answer your question. You know, we're always here to help. Um, and then, you know, if you've got uh, productive suggestions for how we can make these webinars better, you know, all years, if there's specific topics you want to hear about, if there's specific states you want to hear about, uh, please let me know. So, you know, here's just a, a little intro um, to ourselves as a law firm. You know, we've been, in uh, in the industry for about ten years now, um, and have been you know our practice is 100% focused on the cannabis industry, so both marijuana and hemp, um, and we we advise the full spectrum of people, everything from you know people who have licenses, operating companies, investors, as well as helping other law firms where you need you know regulatory counsel because you're working on a big M&A transaction and you got to transfer license and. In Colorado and you, and you need someone to help you kind of help the client on that um, so we got offices Denver Boston LA New York Austin and Jacksonville um, and you know I, it's tough tough to keep track at this point because you know we didn't have great records from the beginning days of the industry but we, we certainly worked on the transfer of hundreds of licenses you know all across the US so, you know, I'm just going to start with a little, a brief history session on, on cannabis m and um, Unfortunately, I don't have some of the answers that people ask me for all the time, which is, you know, when, when do you expect m and to pick up again? I, I think we're starting to see some pick up in m and Of course, it's never really gone away, but um, we're, we're tracking this stuff. But here's, you know, as, as a background, let's, let's take a trip back in time to the early days of cannabis m and So, 
you know, for me at least, you know, I moved out from New York to Colorado in uh, sort of the end of 20th, August in 2015. So that to me, that sort of, that those were the early days of cannabis m and um, you know, the, the beginnings of the license regulated market. Of course, it did predate that by, you know, a few years um, with the, the medical markets um, in Colorado. Um, I mean, pre, you know, at the same time, you had also like Washington State had one of the earlier regulated markets, but you didn't really see sort of true M and A um, in the, the the markets where it had been legalized but not regulated. Sort of, you know, the old California model. Um, early days, things were things were small. Um, you know, th there was no real sophistication. Nobody nobody asked for a quality of earnings report. Nobody was doing them. Uh, a lot of people didn't even know what they were. And there were really no public companies, right? So everyone was OTC. Then you come into, you know, what what I like to refer to as the, the boom days. Um, all of a sudden, people discovered that they could tap the Canadian public markets. You saw a rush on the CSE, the Canadian Securities Exchange. Uh, people avoided the, the Toronto Stock Exchange, the Toronto Stock the Venture Exchange in Canada because they would not let you hold a license in the United States because it violated U.S. federal law. Um, you know, just aside, we're focusing on U.S.-based Canada's m and So obviously not talking about the, the you know, the, the, the Canadian m and um, You saw, you know, a, a massive run up in stock prices. Uh, here, this is, you know, I'm just picking, I picked one index, right? So the new Cannabis Ventures Global Cannabis Stock Index. It peaked in January 2018. At around 5x the amount it was in 2016. So, you know, you have this massive run-up in stock prices, and that basically fueled a lot of these transactions, particularly because a lot of the transactions, the consideration was mostly, if not entirely, in stock. Um, and while the stock was trading high, um, you know, people were eager to sell for stock because they they could turn it around. And that that was sort of the era of the of the mega deal. Um, you know, these, these are the, the largest transactions we see today in the cannabis industry. Um, and one of the challenges that we found working on those type of transactions is, as you'll see in this, every additional jurisdiction that gets thrown into the mix in a cannabis transaction adds another layer of regulatory complexity. So if I'm just buying Massachusetts licenses, I just, I have to worry about the laws in the Commonwealth, and I have to think about the local issues, the, the host community agreements uh, associated with those licenses. But what if I'm buying a company, you know, a stock for stock transaction that has licenses in 10 different states, right? Now you're potentially in the case where you need regulatory approval from 10 different state regulators and God knows how many local regulators. Um, and sometimes these regulators sort of view a change up the chain of control as something that doesn't require their um, input because the license is staying with the same company. But at the same time, sometimes they'll say, we need to see the names of every shareholder that's going to hold this license now, right? Which is particularly difficult with a public company because a public company doesn't really have a list of all of its shareholders. Uh, you know, they have a list of non-objecting beneficial owners but they don't have a list of all of the objecting beneficial owners, right? It's just gonna be held in street name. You're gonna see the name of the broker, but you're not gonna know the name of the underlying shareholder. So uh, that's that's sort of like, that was the the challenges in that era. And then now it's, now we've sort of entered what I would call the post boom era. Um, stock prices have come back down to earth. So they went up 5X, now they've kind of come down 5X. And, you know, depending on uh, what, stock index you're looking at, they, they they may be trending in the right direction right now, but you know, I'm not going to pretend to to be an expert here on the public markets. But the bottom line is that that sort of is produced, you know, it's, it's the ability to raise capital on the public markets and on the private markets, which fuel the M&A boom. Uh, and then now, as you've seen financing become more difficult, which we were talking about last time, uh, you know, that has obviously impacted the amount of M&A occurring. So, what you're seeing now is far more smaller deals, more targeted deals, 
less of the sort of the blockbuster, you know, two MSOs joining together. Though, you know, obviously there's still rumors of some big deals being planned um, and, you know, they may come back and they may come back soon. Who, who knows, right? I'm not going to pretend to have a crystal ball here. But the other sort of thing we've seen in this post-boom era are deal cancellations, right? So you look at MedMen Pharmacan, uh, which is a deal that ran into potentially some regulatory issues uh, in New York, Harvest Verano. Um, you know, there's, I don't want to say the regulatory reasons drove the cancellations, but, you know, regulatory approval is one of the challenges you, you, you face here. And, and one thing that we didn't really talk about in, in the boom era, which I think comes up later in the slides, is the need for HSR approval, um, which, you know, transactions above a certain size, and we're not going to get into the specific HSR here, but, uh, you know, it has sort of been alleged by a whistleblower uh, that Bill Barr was effectively directing the DOJ to take a second look at these transactions, you know, resulting in extension of the HSR period, which delayed the transactions closing. Um, obviously, in addition to the federal approval, the HSR approval, you also need local approval. And then so we're seeing more focused M&A, and then you're seeing these sort of new vehicles arrive. The SPACs, um, which are out there looking for deals right now, though we haven't really seen anyone close a big SPAC transaction in the U.S., the REITs, um, which are active, um, again, you know, focused on real estate investment. It's not really driving M&A uh, and debt as well. Um, you know, you have seen some debt deals in the space, but you haven't really seen um, leveraged buyouts uh, in, in the cannabis space because there's not anyone providing acquisition financing. So, you know, we're going to talk about a little bit here about expansion. Um, you know, what, what drives M&A, right, from, from a business perspective? Uh, well, obviously, a lot of things, which we you don't have to sort of get into here, but one thing in the that's unique in the cannabis industry is the desire to acquire new licenses, right? Uh, to operate a cannabis business, uh, you need a license, right? And, and the availability of licenses depends, varies wildly across the U.S. Um, you know, you, you can... In some cases, right, the only option for acquiring new licenses is to buy an existing business. Other states will allow you to apply for and win new licenses. So you have to look at this at both, and this is one of the recurring messages here, is it's, it's not just state by state, it's locality by locality. So let's just talk a little bit about specifics here to try and be helpful. Um, California, Cassie, you want to talk real quick about uh, opportunities in California? Sure. Um, I think the story in California from day one has really been the lack of availability of local licenses. Um, when California enacted uh, AUMA, uh, as well as the medical laws that were then conformed into Malcursa, which is our current regulatory system, they gave a great deal of discretion to local governments. And, and unlike other states, uh, you actually have to have local government approval or local authorization to proceed uh, before you apply at the state level. And so that local approval is really the first um, first uh, barrier to entry that the cannabis businesses face. Um, over the past three years of legalization, we've seen some loosening of local governments uh, willing to do business with, with cannabis. And I think the, the pandemic and sort of subsequent uh, financial constraints that a lot of the local governments in the state, as well as the state government, are finding themselves under uh, will have a, a positive impact on on the proliferation of cannabis licensing. But, you know, the story in California has been that even though uh, licenses are not really restricted at the state level, with a, a few exceptions um, that haven't really played a major factor in, in how businesses are able to uh, expand and operate thus far, has been finding a local license. And so you'll see, you know, retail licenses in LA, for example, which has limited licenses available, um, you know, people trying to ask 5 million, 10 million plus uh, for companies that don't even really generate that much revenue and aren't necessarily in a, a great area uh, to drive at least uh, storefront retail sales. Uh, so that's very much been the um, dynamic here. And I think, it, you know, in other states, operators have been able to go to the state government and kind of, you know, get that approval and sort of a kind of a 
certificate showing that you know the state government at least trusts them and and thinks that they're going to be good operators and then go to the local governments which tend to be pretty conservative and are able to say well hey look we have these bona fides from the state you know we're going to be good operators and and here you're asking you know people with very little context in cannabis to kind of give that first approval um and you know most of them have gone to sort of limited licenses and and narrow rollout so even though it's a huge state with a huge cannabis market um, it could be a lot bigger if more local governments um, were to play ball. And and just one more point on that, you know, cannabis legalization in California also occurred at a time of like, pretty significant economic prosperity for the state as a whole. And so real estate prices are very high uh, and lo local governments were also, um, you know, doing pretty well financially, as opposed to a state like Colorado, uh, where, you know, adult use legalization uh, occur just as you know the state was starting to come out of the of the last recession uh, and had a lot of underutilized office and industrial space uh, that was then vitalized uh, by the cannabis industry. Um, the dynamic here has been a lot different, so it's going to be interesting to see um, what transpires with some of the the results of the pandemic and and associated impacts. Thanks, and 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 by the way, we'll we'll send around everyone sort of an update with the with the deck to the group that includes some information on localities in california that are currently having licensing opportunities so um you try that? yeah and then so on colorado um colorado is, is pretty similar to california in the sense that there's no real restriction on licenses at the state level the issue is really at the local level um you know you obviously there's a you know if you look at the state population a lot of it's sort of in the area the greater sort of denver area Denver does have a moratorium on new licenses other than manufacturing. So, you know, if you're trying to acquire storefront refill in Denver, you know, you're going to have to do an acquisition. Uh, otherwise, across the state, it's a hodgepodge. You know, it, it, you know, small towns can vary widely. Um, but, you know, in terms, of, in terms of certain highly in demand licenses, it, it acquisitions the only game in town. Um, and then quickly on New York, same story. And New York is different in the sense that it is a limited license state, and that's why I put it up here, just so everyone gets sort of the, the, a fla you know, the other flavor of licensing, which is a limited license state where they, the state will say, we are only going to issue a small number of licenses. In New York, it was five initially, and then they issued five additional ones. There are 10 total licensees in the state. Um, and you know, for the time being, until the law changes or until adult use passes, not good at some point. Um, you know, you, you know, acquisitions the only game in town. Jeremy. So in Massachusetts, uh, similarly, uh, at the state level, the biggest limitation is the control uh, restriction. So you can't you can't under control more than three licenses. Other than that, if you want to grow organically, the state doesn't limit the, the number of licenses that are out there. So the limiting factor is really going to be at the uh, at the local level. Um, and that comes in a couple of different, a couple of different forms. You need to get a host community agreement from a municipality, um, which, uh, sometimes municipalities can limit the number of, uh, of marijuana establishments in the community. Uh, in some instances they have to go through a vote to, you know, outright ban it. Um, but that can be a limitation. Um, in addition, you know, some communities will have a local licensing process. Um, some might have a request for proposal process. These are the types of things that are going to limit you and, and might put you in a position where um, you can't you can't just apply for a license or it's not feasible to do so, and, and you're better off uh, seeking uh, an acquisition. Um, so, it's some, somewhat similar to other states, and the the local process is really where your restrictions are going to be heaviest and limit you there. Cool. Thank you. All right, so you know, before we get into the uh, the structural questions, let's just talk about sort of the initial stage of M&A due diligence and, and how to think about it uh, in a cannabis industry perspective. Um, so as you see here, this is going to be we're going to I'm going to be talking about issue spotting uh, mostly because, as I said before, cannabis M&A is a state by state and locality by locality issue. So unless we're talking about specific state. In the specific locality, we have to speak in generalities. Um, but obviously, the same issues pop up time and time again, regardless of the location. So first thing I would say is, you know, first thing you got to look at when you're talking about a cannabis deal or one's been presented to you is, is can this deal even be done? Um, 
I routinely see people pitch us deals um, that are not legal, um, which isn't to say that there's ways to creatively structure around it, but anytime you're structuring a workaround, you got to think about the level of regulatory risk involved. They're not guaranteed. Um, so, you know, this is an area in which cannabis differs from other trans other industries, right? Where you don't necessarily need to think like, hey, can I even legally do this deal? Um, but that, that really needs to be your first question in the cannabis industry. And, and we'll really drill down on this after we kind of quickly go through due diligence, because I think uh, this, is, this is where we can sort of uh, share the most information with people. So um, I'm just gonna kind of quickly check through some items here that we do when we're thinking about due diligence. And you know, we sent around this article after the, the financing call, but I'm, I'll send it around after this one as well. And it's sort of our kind of analysis of, of due diligence in the cannabis industry. Um, so just talking about licenses, obviously the licenses are incredibly critical to a cannabis business. Um, the ability to verify licenses online varies from state by state, um, you know, as well as, you know, whether there are any black marks against those licenses, whether that's publicly disclosed will also vary state by state. Um, you, you gotta also think about the status of the license, you know, some states, well, many states have sort of a provisional license that becomes final once you're ready to operate. Um, and then, you know, you can't forget the local license as well. Uh, regulatory violations, um, you know, states take different procedures in terms of whether a regulatory violation is determined to sort of live with the license. Uh, Colorado is a state where the regulators will say that the, the, the violation is tied to the license. So even if there's a totally new ownership group, there was an earlier violation and another violation occurs, you know, they're going to treat it as, you know, this is the second time you've had an issue with this license, even if the ownership group is totally separate. Um, background checks can be important here, um, particularly because ownership and control uh, by sort of non-permissible parties is a huge issue for regulators. Um, there can be implications from UCC searches, undisclosed debt in some, in some cases can be a regulatory violation. Um, you know, you're also thinking about taxes. Sometimes if you have unpaid taxes, particularly with the state in question, you may not be able to get a, a change of ownership approved. It, you know, it may require you to pay the taxes in the interim. And turn it over to Cassia here. Yeah, I was just going to make a point on the taxes. Um, for California businesses in particular, we've had, um, you know, legal operations here uh, at the state level for about three years. And there have been no audits whatsoever of, uh, you know, cannabis businesses operating, at least at the state level in that time. Uh, and, you know, the IRS audits in arrears as well. And so just being able to, you know, see what they filed for taxes um, doesn't nece isn't necessarily indicative of what the overall debt of the company may be, you know, once those audits come. So in terms of, you know, holdbacks and negotiations, um, you should be analyzing those those returns with a um, savvy cannabis CPA or other tax professional to kind of get a sense of what the liability may be, because a lot of companies are, you know, not, um, you know, taking a conservative position with respect to 280E, as well as, you know, any other issues that might come up with what they're reporting and, and their records at the state level. Yeah. Um, you know, here's just a, a story about a regulatory violation. This is kind of, you know, I would say this is this tends to be the worst case scenario, which is that, um, you know, executives doing time for, for a regulatory violation. But, uh, you know, this, this is the kind of thing you want to watch out for. And, and uh, you know, without getting into too much in the details of this case, this, this was a case where, you know, the, the regulatory violation question was not even particularly egregious, in my opinion. Um, you know, it's it a little bit of gray area, but they cracked down hard here. Um, taxes, uh, you know, as, as Cassie has said, you know, taxes can be a big issue, right? And there's almost the two buckets of taxes that typically present as issues, right? There's the, the state and local taxes. Uh, a lot of states will have tax regimes specific to cannabis. Um, and, you know, of course, if you're not in compliance with that, that can create an issue from a regulatory approval standpoint. Um, and the other one is is the 280E liability, which is sort of beyond the scope of what we're talking about today, but it can be a significant uh, liability for these companies and something that you need to think through carefully. Um, 
again, going back to compliance, you know, a lot of this compliance information is not necessarily public. Um, again, in some states it is, some states it isn't. So, so you do need, it, it can be challenging to, to suss it out as part of a diligence project, um, which is why in a lot of cases, you know, you're not diligencing specific compliance uh, with specific rules, but rather the sort of culture of compliance is what we refer to it as. Um, you know, some companies, I would say in cannabis, pretty close to 100% of companies say they take compliance seriously. Um, it's, in my experience, it is not the case that that's true. Uh, it's something people like to say. Uh, but the unfortunate reality is taking, you know, taking compliance seriously is something that costs time and money. Uh, and some companies dedicate time and money to it, some do not. Um, and so it's sort of important to, to pressure test this as part of the due diligence process. And I just, I could just add to that also, both compliance with respect to regulatory issues, as well as uh, kind of speaking more broadly and getting local approvals. And, you know, we saw issues in Massachusetts having to do with the, the mayor in, in Fall River um, that can crop up as, as issues that, that might impact the local approvals there. Um, so you want to make sure that um, all those approvals are, are obtained above board and, and by the books uh, so that that doesn't come to bite you afterwards. Cool, thanks. And yeah, so this again, you know, these are other cannabis regulatory diligence issues that we see commonly um, that I'll check through quickly here. But of course, you know, the other sort of typical diligence items that you would do um, both from a financial perspective and from a legal perspective are also important in the cannabis industry. But things like products liability and vaporizers, we've seen issues around, uh, and I think that'll come back. Uh, ancillary companies are their own um, unique challenges here. Uh, you know, if an ancillary company is doing business with licensed companies, you, you want to think through how those arrangements are structured. Uh, and whether those arrangements are compliant and whether the ancillary companies, how close they are to the line of ownership. Um, and, you know, in some states, Massachusetts and California, the um, tech companies are specifically regulated by the cannabis regulations. In some cases, they're not. Insurance, um, just, you know, for those that haven't heard, you know, a lot of cannabis companies are sort of underinsured. Part of this is due to the, the, the price of insurance in, in certain categories. And then you also have to look at the exclusions here. Um, Real estate, you know, again, you know, it's it, one of the critical components of cannabis m and is you almost, it, they will look at the leases, right? One thing regulators particularly care about um, is uh, the approval to control the license premises. So in, in a lot of cases, sometimes the last item you're chasing uh, for submitting for a change of ownership is approval from the landlord to the transaction. Um, so that, that's kind of the unique real estate aspect in cannabis. Banking. Um, you know, do their banks know what they do? Um, how stable are their bank accounts? Um, and, you know, also thinking about structure, uh, are there going to be any issues taking over the bank accounts? Because it, it can be difficult to get new bank accounts and cannabis to e exposure we talked about and then hemp and CBD, which is, you know, complex area that we don't really have time to talk about today. But, um, you know, you, you want to check, you know, you may be completely on the right side of federal law if you're a hemp company you may not be. Um, the, the specifics matter, particularly, you know, things that we've seen cause trouble for people are making medical claims about products, advertising and marketing generally. So let's talk about deal structure, because I think this is probably the most important part for those listening to this uh, presentation. So first one is you got to think state and local. Um, you know, that that's why it's tough for us sometimes, you know, we get these calls, you know, are, you know, we got a buyer who's looking at a deal uh, it's in six states. You know, what, what's what's your thought on the structure? Well, some states, the locality is not important. And then in some states like a California, let's say the locality is going to be the most important part of the deal because the, the state level piece is not as complicated as in the other states. So, um, again, think about it through both lenses. And then if you want to analyze a transaction, you need a list of all the states and all localities. Okay. First, first big bucket, transferability. Um, not all licenses are transferable. Some licenses are restricted for a certain period of time post award. Uh, some licenses, you know, social equity license, for example, uh, cannot be fully transferred. 
um, without impacting uh, the social equity component of the license. That that may be possible to lose it in some cases. In some cases, it may not, and the regulators won't approve it. Um, you know, there can be issues if you've got a company that's you know one parent company that owns a ton of different licenses, and one of those licenses is non-transferable. That might spoil the whole transaction. Um, and you know, thinking about these things, th this is why structuring is so important in these transactions. Because you know, if you've got one license that cannot be transferred, so you can't just do a straight you know stock for stock sale with a parent company, you got to think about that in advance because it may be possible to to transfer it into a, a parallel any in advance. But you, you really got to think about these things well in advance. Um, and then you know, broadly speaking, you've got sort of of the transferable licenses, some licenses require pre-approval to transfer, some will require more of a notice component. Uh, and then timing in terms of approval can vary significantly between jurisdictions. And this is one reason why it can be challenging to do a multi-state deal because, you know, it may be that you get approval in one state, but they won't sit on the approval. You know, you've got a certain period of time to close and other states where it takes month after month after month to get approval. So it may be difficult to get it lined up. Asset versus equity deals. Some states uh, treat ec asset deals different than equity deals, meaning that if, if you're just changing the ownership, that's one process, or it may not even require pre-approval. But if you want to move the license from one company to another company in an asset transaction, that may either require an entirely new application, as may be the case in California, Cassie will talk about that, um, and, or uh, it may simply not be permissible at all. Um, so again, um, you want to think about these things in advance, and you know, in, it, it really does vary state by state. Colorado, for example, you see a lot of asset deals because the regulators will treat it the same as an equity sale. Ownership issues. Um, so here's where you got to think about who the buyer is um, and whether it's going to present any issues for the transaction at issue. One big issue in Massachusetts, Jeremy mentioned, is license caps. Uh, you've got a license cap in Massachusetts, and if your buyer already has the maximum number of licenses, you're not going to be able to sell your license to, to them. It's going to create a major issue. Um, there can be other stuff, other nuances with things like testing licenses where many states will not allow you to own a testing license and a non-testing license, like a cultivation license at the same time to avoid conflicts of interest. And you also wanna think through uh, on the buy side, are your owners gonna be okay with the disclosure and background checks necessary for this transaction? And uh, again, with the license cap issue, suitability comes into play as there as well. You gotta look through who their owners are. Um, alternative structures, I'm sort of speeding up here so we can get to the state by state stuff and, and leave time for questions. But as I was talking about earlier, um, you know, it may be that you are able to sell a company where the licenses cannot be transferred because you set up a parallel company that has arrangements with the license company and you sell, say, just the real estate uh, uh, of the license business. Very uh, state by state, and locality by locality specific, how this is done um, and how how much risk is involved invo involved in it. Um, and, and again, so, you know, typically you, these are sort of the arrangements you see between um, in these cases. Sometimes you'll see options. I, I don't have that on this list here, but uh, an option to buy may be acceptable in certain states. A lot of states don't even address options. You, you see them, you know, the draft regulations in Massachusetts just started to address uh, options and previously was silent. But management services agreement, IP licensing, real estate loans, those are all kind of ways that people structure around a license that may not be able to be transferred. Um, and then ancillary companies is just, you know, sort of its own bucket of issues in terms of just knowing what you're stepping into. Um, because again, even, even if you're not licensed, you may still be subject to background check or disclosure issues from a regulator. So you got to think about that up front. All right. So let, let's get into the state by state discussion so I can turn it over to someone else here. Um, Cassia. Great. It's my time to shine for California. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, so there's, there's a lot to talk about in California. Um, it's a very active state for M&A activity in cannabis, as well as, um, you know, just 
investors looking to, uh, you know, ne not necessarily acquire a uh, hundred percent of the equity in a business, but maybe, um, help that company to expand because it is a, a pretty open market and um, a lot of opportunity here, a lot of uh, customers as well. It is a complex state to do business in, and this expands well beyond cannabis. Um, you know, we, we love our uh, bureaucracy and regulations here in California. Uh, and as such, have three different departments that license various types of cannabis uh, depart cannabis businesses currently, uh, in addition to CDTFA, which is the state's um, tax and revenue board, uh, which taxes the, the companies. We are anticipating a consolidation in 2021 uh, of the agencies uh, under Governor Newsom's plan. Uh, there is going to be a single regulatory agency um, hopefully starting 2021 and moving forward, which will provide some certainty and hopefully less complexity for um, potential buyers in the space um, looking to um, acquire cannabis assets. Um, to date, if you are looking to you know, buy a, a vertically integrated company, for example, you're looking at, at three different sets of regulatory requirements. And in a lot of cases, they are complementary, but not necessarily um, completely analogous. Uh, some of the agents and indeed individual regulators at the state level seem to have a significant discretion to interpret their uh, regulations differently. And so, you know, providing certainty to uh, folks coming in and, and doing an acquisition um, as, an, as an equity transfer is a significant um, challenge for, you know, both consultants and the, the companies alike. Um, as Charlie alluded to a couple times on the call, California at the state level does not allow a license to be transferred from one entity to another. That is period, no exceptions made. Even if it's 100% of the same ownership group, they're not going to allow it. Um, however, they will allow you to uh, change uh, up to 100% of the actual equity uh, ownership on the, the license so long as at least one owner for regulatory purposes remains on the license and for regulatory purposes um, that could uh, apply to an individual who doesn't actually own equity in a company but is instead um, you know perhaps an, an officer or director of the company uh, the manager of an LLC etc so we've uh, structured deals um, largely to date as equity transfers um, because of the limitations at the state level However, we have been working on asset deals as well. As the state licensing uh, structure has matured, we kind of have more certainty in how long it will take uh, for the state to actually process a new application. And although they're not required to do it uh, by the regulations, individual analysts um, have been willing to work with companies who are current license holders um, to say, hey, we have a new company coming in that's going to be ultimately taking over our premises. We're going to continue to operate at this premises until that uh, new, new co has an application filed and approved, at which point we're going to surrender our license and their license is going to become effective. Um, so that, that's worked in certain circumstances and it's been complicated in, in others. Um, you're certainly going to have to pay new uh, application and license fees. Uh, for example, and again, there's no regulatory mechanism that outlines the procedure, so uh, it, there's not as much certainty involved uh, as with an equity transfer. Even with an equity transfer, though, certainty is um, you know, not the, the name of the game in California because the regulators uh, frequently change their positions on uh, how they view these, you know, 100% ownership changes. Um, we've seen them sort of change positions at uh, the Bureau of Cannabis Control, which is sort of the lead agency here, from their position uh, in 2018 into 2019. Uh, now in 2020, they you know seem to favor different things than they did originally. Uh, and Charlie mentioned the um, pre-approval uh, versus sort of a post-closing uh, administrative notice. Uh, California is that post-closing notice system. Uh, and for example, we've uh, filed documents on one deal that closed uh, over a year ago. Um, I think it was in August of 2019, we filed a notice of ownership change on uh, one deal we were working on and just received comments uh, two weeks ago uh, from the agency 
saying that you know they needed more information and more disclosures of um, of individuals associated with the parent co entities up the chain. Um, which was not only did it take them a year to respond, but was also completely contradictory to uh, a number of positions and similar deals that they had taken previously. Um, the good news is, though, is that it can be done, and uh, it's not, a, you know, a, 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 they're not going to just uh, proactively cancel the license or, or, you know, terminate things, impose fines or anything like that. You just have to work with them to get to a place where they will accept the transaction. Uh, and it is largely a discretionary process, so long as the individuals, um, sort of largely administrative process and non-discretionary, so long as you, you know, meet all their requirements, which can change from time to time. Uh, again, with an asset deal, a new state application and license is required. At the local level, uh, Charlie, go ahead. Do you have a something to add there? I was, I was just gonna nudge you along gently because I, I realized I didn't give you, leave you much time, but I was just going to make, I just wanted to make sure I had some time for Jeremy. Sure. We got a at the, sure. Uh, at the local level, um, the review can be discretionary and, and Charlie mentioned, you know, social equity licenses and other types of licenses that cannot necessarily be transferred. So while some local governments will allow for an asset transfer, meaning one license to be transferred from one entity to another. Um, they don't always do that, particularly um, as in California, merit-based licenses are, are very common and, and popular for local governments. A lot of times local governments are reluctant to transfer those licenses to a new company if they feel that they were only awarded to a specific company based on the merits. Okay. I will wrap up with that, Charlie. Thanks. Well, yeah, if we have, we have questions about California, you know, please put them in and, you know, I'll, I'll turn the mic back over to Cassie. So I'm going to try and be quick here. Um, I'm just going to quickly say Colorado, like I'm not going to talk about it because we're running out of time here, but I will send an article in Colorado around. But uh, Jeremy, Massachusetts? Yeah, so in Massachusetts, and I'll run through this um, a little bit quickly here. And, and again, a lot of this, a lot of the process will be, um, very specific to the to the locality, but at the state level, um, an important difference between Massachusetts and California, for example, is that it's a um, pre-approval process. So you have to submit to the state um, to get approved for a, a transaction. Transactions can be structured as either uh, asset deals or as equity uh, transactions. I'd say I'd say the majority uh, are equity transactions, um, but there are certainly some instances where an asset deal makes sense um, and, and can be done. Um, the timing at, at the state level is, is significant. Uh, I'd say six to 10 plus months, um, and it can definitely go, the, the plus is there for more complex transactions, bigger companies. Um, the rule of three, the, the three license cap is something that is um, significant there that they really wanna make sure that uh, some of these big companies that don't have uh, interest in other licenses in Massachusetts that uh, they're not aware of. So they're, they're going to do a lot of their own investigation to make sure that um, everything is uh, keeping within those those limitations there. Uh, at the local level, at, at the most basic level, you're going to have a host community agreement that's going to need to in, often be assigned. If it's an equity transaction, the assignability language might sort of allow without any any approval that uh, that assignment. I would say even in that case, uh, it's always good to speak with the municipality so that they know a new group is coming in because you don't want a, uh, a municipality to be caught off guard by a, a transaction like this. Um, so that's, it's not gonna be good for anybody. Um, the approval for that transfer might take the form of something as simple as coordinating with the municipalities, uh, you know, town council, um, or it could be a, a broader process of presenting to the municipality. Um, at a high level, these transactions can get done. Similar to California, if they're asking for more information, they'll keep asking you for the most part until um, you satisfy the concerns. Um, but, you know, really the biggest issue is timing. And with the timing comes, uh, you have this big gap between signing and closing. And so, you know, these businesses want to keep moving. And so how do they do that? A lot of times groups will 
of explore interim arrangements, whether that's some kind of uh, interim debt financing, maybe some kind of consulting arrangement. The difficulty there is making sure that you don't implicate the control uh, restrictions because taking control is the same as taking ownership needs pre-approval. And so, and the regulations around this are quite broad. Um, certain levels of consulting and even potentially, uh, you know, covenants and debt arrangements might implicate control. And you have to be very careful to um, not run afoul of those regulations. Otherwise, uh, you risk some regulatory enforcement. So that's kind of the, the quick high level there. Um, but obviously, if any questions, I'll I can answer. Thanks, Jeremy. So I'm going to run through the rest of this real quick and then, uh, you know, open it up for some questions here. So this Colorado, we'll talk about that later. Um, and I, I just wanted to mention, you know, if you, if you if you like reading about cannabis, Cassie and I have written a book uh, on cannabis law. It's it's going to come out in December. So, you know, it's, it's a little late for Christmas, but I'm sure the kids will appreciate getting it in January. Uh, all of our profits are going to last prisoner profit, uh, last prisoner project. Um, and yeah, it's, it's sort of the first book by practitioners focused on the on the national market. Um, here's sort of the the items we cover here. You know, it's available for pre-order on Amazon. If if you look uh, in the offers, uh, you can you know kind of click through and, and pre-order a copy today on Amazon. Um, and with that said, let me let me take you know here's our contact information. I know we kind of rushed through this because it's a pretty complex topic. I'm happy to field any questions afterwards. So let me just take a look here at the chat and see um, if I can come up with some some good questions. Hopefully, you know, give um, um, do, do, do. okay. Uh, some ancillary companies are regulated while others are not. Do you want to speculate about what an other ancillary companies may be regulated in the future and how federal regulation may affect ancillary M and A? Uh, Cassia, you want to? Talk about that. Uh, sure, I, I'm. I'm not certain. I have the crystal ball about all ancillary companies um, in federal regulation. I. I. It did make me think um, uh, a little bit about um, the California model and um, potential regulation of brands. Um, so companies that don't have a licensed facility, um, but who are you know, licensing their intellectual property um, and doing business with uh, ca licensed cannabis operators. There's been quite a bit of talk about, uh, you know, regulating or creating a, a separate license type uh, for at least that category of ancillary companies. And I think that um, at the federal level as well, there may be some, uh, particularly since they're you know, most likely to defer to the states for actual, uh, you know, regulatory structure. There may be some types of ancillary companies that are captured within, you know, the the regulated cannabis purview, and you know, others that, you know, for example, real estate that are probably going to continue to be regulated by other sets of rules that already exist. Um, you guys have other thoughts on that topic, Jeremy? I don't know if I have anything else to add to that. I, I think I can see uh, I can see regulators wanting to get their um, get get their foothold on on what ancillary companies are doing, so that they can regulate it, even if it's just for uh, something like advertising, things like that. Um, but yeah, I think it, it kind of yet to be seen um, how how far they'll be able to go without you know necessarily people needing licenses from the regulators to, to kind of get their teeth in there. And I think that was some of the impetus for the brand, the sort of unlicensed brand license as well, is that because right. uh, regulating advertising is is uh, deemed to be a high priority. Yeah, yeah. I I think that uh, I guess my my prediction is I haven't seen really much in the way of legislation that would expand the jurisdiction of regulators over ancillary companies they don't have registration uh, um, jurisdiction over now. But what I do think will happen is as regulators sort of get a better hold of what's going on in their markets because it does take them quite some time to sort of get a hold of everything. I think you will see sort of more guidance, uh, maybe rule updates, uh, maybe bulletins on sort of ancillary companies. Uh, and, you know, as, as they start to understand this stuff a little bit better, but I, I think that that's going to unfold slowly. And then in terms of how um, federal regulation may 
impact ancillary M and A. I, mean, I think the the big one is just federal illegality. I think if 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 you see, um, you know, depending on what happens in terms of the election this fall, you know, I've heard some people sort of speculate that institutional investors may get more comfortable um, if they if they if there's an incoming Democratic administration. Um, Maybe not comfortable enough to buy a licensed business, but maybe they will be feel comfortable buying like a tech company. So you know, it could be that um, you know, if you see a signal that uh, you know federal legalization is coming, that you see an uptick in ancillary M and A. Um, let's see, how are joint ventures approached by regulators? Jeremy, you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. So uh, I guess often in Massachusetts, we'll, we'll see a uh, joint venture structured with, uh, you know, the joint venture entities applying for the license. And sometimes you'll see this uh, in connection with uh, social equity applicants um, where you might have uh, social equity participants and then maybe a capital partner um, providing some of the resources. And the, the way it's viewed by regulators, I mean, it's, it, Honestly, very similar to uh, to other entities. Something to keep in mind in Massachusetts is, um, you know, how the joint venture is structured in terms of ownership and, and control. There, the control limitations in Massachusetts are so strict that there's almost no level of participation there that would make you a joint venture that wouldn't constitute control. So, you know, let's say you have a joint venture, maybe you're only like a thirty percent participant in the joint venture. That, that's still sufficient to, that counts to your three license cap. So it's not like you can go beyond the three because you don't have full ownership or you don't have majority ownership. Um, so that's something to keep in mind in, in terms of getting the, the most you can out of the license in Massachusetts. Um, if you're only having pieces of these ventures, you're that you're still going to be stuck at three, um, no matter what. But I'd say I'd say otherwise they're going to be viewed the same. There's going to need to be a lot of cooperation between the ventures in terms of uh, providing background check information, providing information about what each of these parties are doing in other states. For example, Massachusetts collects a lot of information about cannabis activities in other states, and so you, I mean, there. Are, for other reasons also, but you need to have a lot of trust with your joint venture. If they have a regulatory violation, they get a license pulled in another state, um, that's gonna impact your license. The, the joint venture arrangement has to have sufficient uh, provisions that um, maybe somebody can be bought out or divested so that you know that, that venture's license can, can stay uh, protected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that, well, that's an interesting point, you know, what you made at the end about divestiture is, um, you know, you do see that um, in, in this in this space is, you know, best case scenario, you, you've you got divestiture provisions in your agreements, you know, if, if you're, say, you're a buyer who's raising sort of money, putting together a deal and, and then buying something, you may want to consider having ability to buy out some of your investors. Um, because, you know, if one of your investors, you know, for some reason won't comply with the background check request or God forbid, you know, they, they create some sort of issue um, with the license because they've been arrested for something that can put the entire deal at risk. Um, so those those divestiture provisions can be can be quite helpful, um, though, you know, they can be difficult to get across the line. And, and we certainly understand that. Um, so, you know, just. You know, I think we got time for one more question here, but before we do, I just want to say, you know, thanks for joining us. Um, we're going to be sending around an email with some follow-up materials, um, you know, as well as, you know, keep stay tuned for the for the next um, iteration of, of this webinar series while we're still remote. Um, hopefully someday we can have, uh, you know, an in-person uh, sort of seminar. Um, Obviously, reach out to us if you have any questions in the interim, and and then please pre-order the book. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to. Here, here's a question for us to take us out. Um, we wanted to talk about cross-border deals, cross-state deals, cross-national boundary deals. Um, do you have any sort of uh, big takeaways there, Cassia? 
Well, only to uh, sort of go back to your point that they really need to be viewed as a series of transactions um, to determine if they can be structured as one overall uh, transaction uh, or if they need to be kind of separate pieces that are part of a, a, an M&A plan, if you, uh, if you would, um, to be executed on individually. And where are we seeing the biggest issues with um, multi-state uh, acquisitions fail is when companies go in with a structure before really analyzing the, the regulations and the rules for each state. And that's resulted in the unwinding of, uh, you know, a number of large deals in the space, which you touched on. Um, and of course, you know, I think everybody on the call is familiar with the, the basics of, of cannabis law, but the products themselves, to the extent that they are cannabis products, cannot be transported between states, um, that cash can flow from state to state um, with a you know multi-state operator, but all of the cannabis products and, and you know cannabis-specific ingredients need to stay within that market for now. Um, so it, it is um, it increases complexity over a conventional business because you essentially have to duplicate you know multiple um steps of the supply chain from state to state at least to the extent that it's the cannabis touching components of the products yeah and i would just add that you know one thing you see, particularly if you're talking about you know south america and europe a lot of you know the main differences in in a lot of countries right you know let's say colombia for example um they have legalized at the federal level so a, a lot of companies are not going to be comfortable doing cross-border deals with the u.s because it triggers the violation of U.S. federal law, which creates banking issues, and as well as a lot of issues people aren't comfortable with. So the majority of sort of cross-border M&A in the U.S. tends to be companies that are listed on the Canadian Securities Exchange that own U.S. licenses, but they're not necessarily tying together um, operations um, internationally. The, the exception there is, is on, on the hemp side. Uh, because, uh, you know, with the passage of 2018 Farm Bill, that, that is no longer federally legal. So, you know, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, if you have any ideas about things you'd be interested in, in terms of topics for us to discuss, you know, please let us know. Um, and, uh, you know, take care out there and uh, hopefully see everyone soon.